Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well. In this talk, I'm excited to share a new library with you that you can use to train decision forests in TensorFlow. And I'll be giving this talk with Matthew. He's a knowledgeable and helpful software engineer, and you'll see him in a bit. Here's a quick outline of what we'll cover. I'll briefly introduce decision forests, and then I'll talk about the types of problems you can solve with them and the kinds of data they work best with. Then Matthew will walk you through a code example, and I think you'll be happy to see it's just a couple of lines. If you're new to them, a decision forest is a family of machine learning models, including things like random forests and gradient boosted trees. And these can be easier to use than neural networks when you're getting started with machine learning, and they're powerful too. In fact, they can even outperform neural networks with certain types of data. And a decision forest is built from many decision trees like this one. And a tree is simply a series of yes, no questions that classify an item from a data set. For example, you could use this tree to classify an animal as a chicken, a kangaroo, or a cat. And you do that by following the questions and their corresponding path down the tree. And this makes trees easy to interpret, especially in contrast to models like neural networks, so you can understand and explain exactly how your model works. And in addition to being more interpretable, trees can also be easier to use. For example, here's the code to create a decision forest in TensorFlow. You can create your model with a single line of code. It's all set up and ready to go. There's no additional work needed. By contrast, here's the code to create a neural network. And when you're working with neural networks, you often have to design the model yourself. And that means thinking about things like the number and types of layers. And that means deep learning is a little bit more work to get started with. Importantly, in TensorFlow, both decision forests and neural networks use Keras. And this is my all-time favorite API for neural networks, and I'm glad you can use it with trees now as well. This means you can use the same API to experiment with different types of models and find the one that's best for your data. And importantly, you can deploy both models using the same tools like TensorFlow Serving. So if trees are so great, why should you use neural networks at all? And when should you use one type of model versus the other? Well, I'll show you a few examples, and if you can map the problem you want to solve to these, then trees are probably a good fit for you. The best type of model for you to use depends on your data. And basically, there are just two types of data in the machine learning world to be aware of. Structured data is where trees shine. And that's a fancy way of saying tabular data or anything you can fit inside a CSV file. Here's an example of structured data for a classification problem. And each row represents an example, and each column represents a feature. And if you're training a decision for us to classify this data, the features become questions in the tree. You typically have a small number of informative features that you can reason about instinctively. And that's a fancy way of saying that the features describe concepts that you understand. For example, if I asked you what kinds of animals have feathers, you might say birds. The last column represents the label. And as always, you're trying to predict the label from the features. Here's another thing you can do. Trees are great for regression. And in this example, you're trying to predict the weight of an animal based on the same two features. The only thing that's changed is the label. One more cool thing you can do with decision forests is called ranking. And here we've added another column that tells you the type of animal, say a bird or a mammal. And now you can train a forest to rank the animals in each group by how fast you are. And this can be very powerful. The way to use a decision forest is to think about how you can map your problem to one of these examples. Basically, if you can represent your data set in a CSV like these with simple features, then trees are the best place for you to get started. On the other hand, neural networks are great for unstructured data. In unstructured data, the features are complex and you typically have lots of them. This is a data set for image classification, and you can see the features are pixel values from an image. And although it's also represented in CSV, there's an important difference. You and I can't classify an image by reading the pixel values. Instead of simple features that you can reason about, you have tons of complex ones you can't. And this is when you need neural networks to help you train models from these complex features. But if you have simple features, and you often do, that you can reason about, then trees are the best place to start. And just so you know, trees aren't just for beginners. They tend to win a bunch of Kaggle competitions with structured data, despite being relatively easy to use. And with that, let's turn to Matthew for the code. Thank you, Josh. Now let's take a look at some code, and I will show you how easy it is to train a decision forest in TensorFlow. You start by importing a dataset. Here, your dataset is stored in a CSV file, and you use Panda to load it. Imagine this is a structured data, just like the one you showed earlier. Next, you convert the Panda data frame into a TensorFlow dataset. If you're new there, know that TF data is a solution to handle large data set. And you can use a function 
PD data frame to TF dataset to do the conversion. For larger problems, you might operate directly with TF data, but if your data fits in memory, this one line is all you need. Next, you create the model and learning algorithm. In this example, you use a random forest. Note that you don't specify any of the hyperparameter there. It means the default hyperparameter value will be used. And while not optimal, they often give reasonable results and are a great way to start. Finally, you train the model. Not shown here are the training logs to monitor the training and help you further improve the model, but we will talk a bit more about that later. Hey, did you notice that you didn't have to one out encode or normalize a feature? In fact, you did not apply any preprocessing like it is often done with neural network. You didn't even list the input feature. This is one of the advantages about Decision Forest. They natively handle numerical and categorical features and save you a lot of time. After the model is trained, you can evaluate it on a test dataset using model.evaluate or make prediction with model.predict. Those are the classical KRS API methods. Finally, you save the model in a TensorFlow save model, which has one important benefit. It means you can save the model just like any other TensorFlow model using TensorFlow serving. In other words, you are free to use the best model for the job, whether it is a decision forest, a neural network, or maybe a combination of both. And if you already have a TensorFlow infrastructure in place, you can use it to test and eventually deploy your decision forest. In the previous slide, we trained a random forest. Now, let's train a different type of model and change its hyperparameter a bit. The main documentation sits on GitHub and tensorflow.org, but there I will show you an interesting trick. In Colab, you can write a question mark followed by a function or a class to get its documentation. I'm sure the R user will appreciate this. So, coming back to the example, we have a gradient booster tree model, which is another popular decision for rest algorithm, and we see a few of its hyperparameters I selected. Following the documentation, you can instantiate the model and train it. Now, let's take a look at one another important feature. A nice way to understand how a decision tree works, or to get in some insight about the problem, is to print the tree. And of course, the library can do that. In this example, you print the structure of one tree, and you might find it interesting to walk through the first branches of the model and get an idea of what the model is doing. This next example shows the variable importances. They tell you how much each feature matters to the model, and they are key for model interpretation. Going further, you can access the tree as a recursive Python object and directly inspect its structure. In the example, you first print the entire tree object, and on the second line, you access a bit of its structure, namely the threshold value in a split. This is the end of the coding part. There are many features we did not show you, and we encourage you to take a look at the collab and the documentation on GitHub. If you have any question about decision for us in TensorFlow, please ask them on our new discussion forum linked on this slide. Feedbacks are welcome and very useful, including telling us what feature you would like to see implemented next. As I already mentioned, we have resources for you to learn more and the best place to start is tensorflow.org slash tutorials. There, you will find a new tutorial we created for you. And you can check our blog, YouTube channel, Twitter feed, and your GitHub to stay up to date. On this note, I would thank you all for your time and hope you will enjoy using our library.